invitation and for this wonderful opportunity. And thanks everyone for being here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to speak here. So today the talk is about the singular set in the fully nonlinear obstacle problem. And it's based on a recent joint work with Ovidio Savin. Right, so basically, uh, before I move to the fully nonlinear version of the problem, let me actually start with the classical version, which is actually the problem that Xavi has talked about. But, but in case you missed this talk, let me just give you a quick review of what's going on with this classical version of the obstacle problem. Right, so basically, in this problem, uh, we're physically modeling a very simple situation. We're just pushing an uh, elastic membrane towards an obstacle uh, with a constant force, actually. All right, so let's see. So this is the picture. So imagine omega is some domain in the d-dimensional Euclidean space. And at the height of this domain, there's an obstacle you cannot go through. Right? And along the boundary of the domain, we fix some membrane at height g. And inside, inside the domain, we start pushing down the membrane towards the obstacle. And we're using constant force equals 1 here. But since you are pushing down, the membrane will bend down like this. But in the region where the membrane is still strictly above the obstacle, right? that is in this region uh, when your function is still strictly positive. So in this region, uh, the, the shape of the membrane is determined by the balance between the force and elasticity. Right? That, so that means in this non-contact set, that's when your function is positive, in this contact set, you have Laplace of u equals one. This is precisely saying the elasticity and the force is balanced in this region. But, but then you keep pushing and pushing, and after your membrane becomes in contact with the obstacle that is in, in this region, then there's nowhere you can go. I mean, you, you cannot penetrate the, the obstacle. So in that region, uh, you have to follow the shape of the obstacle, which is flat. So in the contact set, a plus view is zero. Right? So, so basically, this is the problem. And of course, the most interesting feature is there is a jump uh, in the right-hand side of the equation. And this jump happens along the interface that is a priori unknown to us. Right? As Chubby was saying, this is a typical free boundary problem. And the free boundary in this problem is just the, the, the topological boundary of the positive set of the, of the solution. Right? So this is the place where the jump happens. OK, so yeah, so this is the picture. And this is the classical obstacle problem. And as Chubby was saying, we also sometimes we'll see a different formulation. So this is the picture for the dual formulation of the problem. So in this picture, again, the, the, the top function is membrane, and the bottom function is the obstacle. But now we are not pushing the membrane anymore. The membrane is free. But we are not having a zero obstacle. The, the obstacle itself is non-zero. So in this formulation, uh, the equations are like the follows. Right? So again, the membrane has to be on top of the obstacle. So u has to be larger than or equal to phi. And so when they are in contact, when u is phi, uh, they have to share the same Laplacian because the, the, the membrane has to follow the shape of the, of the obstacle. Right? But once they become detached, once u is strictly above phi, uh, u is harmonic. Because once your membrane is free to move up and, up and down, it is a harmonic function. Right? So this is a slightly different formulation of the same problem. And basically, to go back, back, to, go back to the previous formulation, you just take the difference between u and phi. OK, so, so most of the time, we'll be focusing on the, on the first formulation. But we'll, we'll also see, uh, for one instance, the second formulation. OK, so let me continue from here. Yeah, so again, this is the problem. And the main question in this problem is, what is the regularity of the free boundary? So as Shabby was saying, generically, we should expect this free boundary to be smooth everywhere. Right? But we are interested in a slightly different problem. We're not interested in uh, what happens generically. We're interested in what happens for all the boundary data. Right? So in this case, just give me a boundary data. What can I say about this uh, regularity of this free boundary? OK, so I mean, the starting point is actually very simple. So we just start by looking at some uh, typical solutions to the problem. So here we have the first class of solutions, which, which is just uh, which is so-called uh, half-space solutions. So what we're doing is we're taking one direction, E, and then we're taking the one-dimensional parabola in this, in this direction. But then we're only taking one half of the, of the parabola, and in the other half space, everything is zero. So this is the formula. So really, it's a one-dimensional parabola, but we're only taking one half of it. So you can see this, this solves the problem in the entire space. OK, and another class of solution is 
even simpler. It's just a parabola. So you just take a full parabola in this case. And in this case, to make sure uh, your function is non-negative, you have to make sure the coefficient matrix is non-negative definite. And to make sure you solve Laplace of, of u is one in the positive set, you have to make sure the trace of a is one. Right? So this is the so-called parabola solutions. I mean, so, so basically, both class of solutions that are very simple in the sense that uh, they're global solutions and they're both homogeneous of degree two. But in, in some sense, these two solutions actually complete uh, the complete opposite of each other in terms of how much contact there is. So if you look at the half space solutions, uh, there is real contact between the membrane and the, the obstacle. So in this, for these solutions, the contact set is actually an entire half space. It is real contact. There's a lot of contact between the membrane and the obstacle. And for parabola solutions, I mean, there is still contact, but the contact set is just the kernel of A. And if you assume the trace of A is one, this kernel will always be of lower dimension. So for this class of solutions, you only have tangential touching, tangential contact along a lower dimensional set. Okay, and you can also see this uh, contrast by, by computing the second derivatives. So for the half space solutions, since there is real contact, uh, actually the, the second derivatives will jump. Right? Laplace is one here, Laplace is zero here. So for this solution, the, uh, it's only C11. The second derivatives are bounded, but they're not continuous. But for parabola solutions, since you only have tangential touching, this tangential touching is not really affecting the second derivatives. So here, the solution is actually smooth everywhere. So, so that's just two typical class of solutions. But, but of course, the, the main observation is actually somehow these two are the only possible behaviors along a free boundary. So this is what Kafferty proved in 77. So there is a dichotomy for free boundary points. So take a free boundary points x0. There, there, there are only two possibilities. Right? So either so here what we're doing is we're computing the density of the contact set. So if the density of the contact set is positive, then your, function, your solution looks more or less like a half space solution. And otherwise, if the contact set is of zero density at the point, then your solution looks more or less like a parabola. Right? So, so here, what I mean by the function looks more or less like a half space solution or look like a parabola is in the following sense. So it means uh, in a sequence of balls with vanishing radii, so you have smaller and smaller balls, you have a sequence of them. In this sequence of balls, my solution is well approximated by u0 in a sense that the difference is going to zero faster than the quadratic rate of the radii. Right, so again, there are only two possibilities. Either you have positive density, which means you have real contact. In that case, the solution is well approximated by a half space solution, or otherwise there is, uh, the, the contact set has zero density. So there is only tangential contact. And in that case, your solution is well approximated by a full parabola. So what this allows you to do is it allows you to decompose the free boundary into two pieces. There's going to be the regular part and the singular part. So basically a point, a free boundary point is in the regular set if it satisfies the first possibility, real contact and looks like a half space solution. These are the points in the regular set. And your point will be in the singular set if there is only tangential contact and your solution is well approximated by a parabola solution. So the next step uh, in this development is based on some earlier work by Kindelara and Nuremberg. Kafferty showed that the regular piece is really regular. He is uh, locally analytic. So it's, it's really the best you can hope for. And then the remaining question is right, what, what happens to the singular part? It turns out the problem for the singular part is, is, is much more delicate than the regular part. And it took the effort of many, many uh, mathematicians and so the, but, but the current best result is due to a uh, Figalian Sarah, which was published in la last year. So basically the result reads like following. So, so, so again, D, the number D is the dimension of the ambient space. Your, your, your domain sits in the D-dimensional Euclidean space. So the first line says, uh, the singular set stratifies. It means you should decompose the singular set into uh, D pieces in D-dimension. 
Right? So you should think about each sigma k as the, the k-dimensional part of the singular set. So the next step is, okay, for the lowest stratum, for the zero dimensional part, it's just a bunch of points. So it's really a zero dimensional object. And for k from one to d minus two, that is the, all, all these intermediate values, uh, dimensions, right? what you can show is this stratum, this sigma k part, is locally covered by C1 log manifold of dimension k. So again, it's really a k dimensional piece and it has some regularity. And for the top stratum, for the top stratum, which is the d minus one dimensional part, you can show it is covered by a C1 alpha manifold of dimension d minus one. Right, so again, it is a d minus one dimensional object and it has this C1 alpha regularity. And as, as Chabi was saying, I mean, actually the, the result is more precise than this. They have a further decomposition into generic points and bad points. And the, the generic points are covered by actually C11 manifold and the bad points are just a few but let's not go into this. So, so basically this theorem reads, uh, you can decompose the singular set into D pieces and each piece has the corresponding dimension and is covered by a C1 something manifold. Cool. Yeah, so basically after these two results, if you combine these two, uh, you have a very nice, basically you have a very nice conceptual image in your mind about the contact set. Right, so, so again, you have seen a similar image in, in Chavi's talk. So here I'm drawing the contact set in R3. So this is the region uh, where the, the membrane is touching the obstacle. So here you have a full balloon of a uh, contact set. Right? So the surface of the balloon is, they are all regular points. Because if you take any point here on the surface of the balloon, you look around it, the contact set is of positive density. So here everything are regular points and they are analytic hypersurface. By the theory, by the theorem by uh, Kafferati. Then, after a while, this balloon will develop into a one-dimensional string. So this is the one-dimensional piece of the singular set, and this piece is covered by a C1 log manifold. Uh, in this case, it's just a curve, C1, C1 log curve. Then, after a while, this C1 log curve will develop into a two-dimensional surface, and this piece is the sigma two part of the singular set and is covered by a C1 alpha manifold of two dimensions. And away from all this, you have a bunch of points, which are the zero part, the zero dimensional part of the singular set. Right, so again, I mean, this is just a conceptual picture. There are still many, many open problems about the, the, the contact set, but it's good to have this picture in, in mind when you think about the, the contact set. All right, so that's a nice picture for the classical obstacle problem. But uh, I mean, as Charlie was saying, I mean, this problem has many applications in, in game theory and finance. And for those applications, right, you have to study a different operator somehow. So here the operator is of, of this form. So here what you're doing is we are taking a bunch of coefficient matrices, A1, A2, A3, all these matrices. You assume their eigenvalues are bounded away from zero and bounded away from infinity. And what this operator does is, I mean, give me a function. What I'll do is I'll compute the trace of A1 Hessian, trace of A2 Hessian, you compute all these traces and you, you take the maximum of them. Right, so so this, is the, this is still a, a second order elliptic operator, but it's, it is not linear anymore and it is very far away from the Laplacian. So basically for applications in game theory and finance, you need to study the obstacle problem, but with such operators. So basically now, if you generalize a bit, this is the problem we're studying. So, so in, I mean, it's almost the same problem, but instead of Laplacian, we, are we just have a general function f, and we are plugging this uh, Hessian into this function f. So what this function f is, it means it's a function from the space of symmetric matrices to real numbers, and for the theory to work, it has to be elliptic, meaning the following. So, so this is the ellipticity condition. So it, it is basically saying, well, for this function, if I start from a general matrix M and I start moving in a positive direction of some, along some positive direction P. So this condition says, if I start moving in a positive direction, my function has to increase. And the amount of the increase, the amount of increase when I start moving in the positive direction, the amount of increase is proportional to the distance I have moved along that direction. 
So this is uh, this elliptic condition for a fully nonlinear operator. So basically, what, what this condition gives us is for the such operators, we still have a maximum principle, just as for the case of Laplacian. But I mean, well, if you move away from Laplacian, if you go into this fully nonlinear regime, what you have to give up is you have to give up any kind of divergent structures. But since, since these are non, very nonlinear operators, there's no divergent structures. So this is the operator where we're starting. They are fully nonlinear and they are elliptic. But, 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 but by any means, if you don't like them, just think about f as the trace, then you are back with the Laplacian operator. But just keep in mind, for whatever we do, we cannot use any divergent structure. The only thing we can use is this maximum principle. All right, so again, this is a problem. And there are some technical assumptions. We will also be assuming f is convex and f is C1. So again, the main question is, well, what happens to the free boundary? So, so ideally, you want to recover what, what we can do for the classical obstacle problem. You want to still have this nice picture of a balloon, a string, a two-dimensional piece. You want to still have the same nice conceptual picture in mind. But actually, it turns out a lot of that picture can actually be recovered in this fully nonlinear case. And most of the results known for this operator I mean, is done by Kian Li in his thesis in 98. So he showed the following. So again, there is a nice dichotomy for free boundary points, even in this fully nonlinear problem. So again, give me a free boundary point. I'll compute the density of the contact set. If the contact set has positive density. What I can show is the solution looks more or less like, a, again, a half space solution. But in this case, I and mean, since we're dealing with nonlinear operators, uh, I mean, the coefficient has to change depending on the dimension of the parabola. But still, geometrically, it's still just a one-dimensional uh, half parabola. Okay? So again, positive density means the solution is well approximated by a half space solution. Okay? So again, the other case is when the density of the contact set is zero, then again, the solution is well approximated by a parabola solution. But again, uh, since we're dealing with nonlinear operators, the coefficient is not always one half anymore. You have to change the coefficient depending on the coefficient matrix A. Right? So again, once you have this dichotomy, it allows you to decompose the free boundary into two pieces, the regular part and the singular part. And again, uh, Kian Li showed that the regular part, again, is very regular. So it's always a C1 alpha hypersurface. And if the operator is smooth, you can bootstrap all the way to smoothness. So, so again, the regular part is very regular. So the remaining question is, what happens to the singular part? Can we still stratify the singular part into many pieces? Can we still cover each piece by some manifold with some regularity? So basically, that's the open question. And I mean, basically, nothing is known about the singular set in this setting. And I'd like to say, I mean, this is not an isolated problem. Right? I mean, so, so basically, there are many free boundary problems. And for, for basically for, for most of these nonlinear free boundary problems, I mean, we, we know very little about the singular set. So, so basically, while the, 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 the argument for the regular part is very robust, it can be applied for many, many problems. I mean, very little is known about the singular set once you step away from the Laplacian. So, so what, what's the difference? So basically, the, the fundamental difference between the regular set and the singular set is in terms of the stability of the free boundary. So here, I'm drawing a, a very naive picture in 1D. So in the, in, in the middle, in this, this black curve, I'm just drawing the half space solution in 1D. So it's, it's flat in half space, and it goes up like a parabola. So, so, since this, so here, your membrane is in contact with the free bound, with the obstacle in the entire half space. Right? So in the entire half space, you're pushing the uh, membrane towards a very hard surface. So this is a very, very stable situation. So what you can show is, if I start perturb the data here, right, if I start pushing the data up by epsilon along the boundary, what you'll see is the green curve. So basically, I mean, it's essentially, again, a half space solution. You're just shifting the free boundary to the left by an order epsilon. So if I start pushing down the boundary data by epsilon, then what you have is the, 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 the red curve. So again, it's essentially a half-space solution, but now you're just shifting the free boundary to the right by epsilon. 
So, so basically, since initially for the half space solution, you have full contact in the entire half space. It's very stable. So if I start perturbing the data, uh, what I'll see is basically again, a free boundary solution, uh, a half space solution. I'm just shifting back, for, back and forth the free boundary. So what this tells us is basically around the regular point, right? We know for our solution, around the regular point, our solution looks very much like a half space solution. So using this stability, what we can show is around the regular point, since our solution looks very much like a half space solution, the free boundary to our solution looks very much like a hyperplane. And this case gives us some initial flatness. And from here, you can bootstrap all the way to smoothness. And this is a very, very robust argument. You can apply this to, to many, many problems. Right, so now what happens to the singular part? Right, so, okay, so, so again, here I'm just drawing a naive picture in, in 1D. And here again in the middle, the black curve is, the, is a parabola solution. Right? It, is going, it is touching the obstacle only at the origin. And for this solution, initially, you only have tangential contact. It's, it's only contacting at a point. So this is a very unstable situation. So now if I start perturbing the data here, if I push everything up by epsilon along the boundary, what I have is the green curve. And for the green curve, everything is strictly positive and there's no free boundary at all. So by, by pushing up some slightly, I can remove the entire free boundary. And now if I start pushing down this thing, right, if I start pushing down the boundary data, again by epsilon, what I can show is the solution is gonna be this red curve. So here, uh, you still have some free boundary points, but instead of one singular point, you have two regular points. So basically, initially, it's a parabola touching the obstacle only at the origin. And it's a very unstable, but perturbing the data, I can either remove entirely the free boundary, or I can turn everything into regular points. So this is a very unstable situation. So basically, there's no way you can apply the same argument as for the regular point. So basically, how, how do you deal with this instability? So, so, so for the classical problem, uh, people have, have to use these magical tools called monotonicity formulas. So, so let's so how, how it goes. So for the classical version of the problem, so let's assume always origin is a singular point. So by definition of the singular point, what I know is my solution is well approximated by parabola solution in this sense. In a sequence of balls, my function is very well approximated by this parabola. So then what we can do with all these uh, magic tools called monotonicity formula, there are many versions, there are ACF, Vice, Mono, Elmgren, with all these formulas, what you can do is you can quantify this uh, approximation. So basically, in, instead of a sequence of radii, we can now plug in all kinds of radii now. And also, instead of a little o here, we can quantify this into a uniform modulus of continuity sigma. So basically, this, all these formulas, they, they, they allow you to quantify this approximation. And once you have quantified the approximation result like this, what you can do is I can apply this estimate at different points along the, free, along the singular set. So I apply this estimate at the point x in the singular set. I have a matrix Ax. I apply the estimate uh, at y in a singular set. I have a matrix Ay. So if I use this uh, quantified approximation result, what I can show is a of x to a of y, they'll, they'll change very little if x and y are very close to each other. And I mean, since what I know is around the point x0, my solution looks very much like the parabola with coefficient ax. So you should expect the kernel of ax looks very much like the zero set around x. So in particular, you can show more or less the kernel of ax is the tangent space to the singular set at the point x. So if you go back to this estimate, what you know is basically uh, the, 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 the tangent space to the singular set is changing continuously with exactly sigma as the modulus of continuity. So, so, so from here, you know the tangent space is changing continuously. And from here, you can show I mean, that that's exactly saying the singular set can be covered by a C1, C1 manifold with the normal changing like sigma. And basically, if you want C1 alpha covering for the top stratum, 
what you have to do is you have to get sigma to be a holder decay. And if you want to have C1 log covering, which is the case for intermediate, intermediate stratums, there you have to get sigma like one over log. Right? So, so basically, I mean, this is a very, 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 very beautiful argument for the classical obstacle problem. But, but here you need the formulas. And the, the problem basically is this formula, they only work for the Laplacian. These are very powerful, but they are very restricted tools you can use. They, they, they essentially, they only apply for the Laplacian. And for our problem, which is a fully nonlinear version of the problem, which our operators doesn't have any divergent structure, and there's no way you can have these formulas. So basically, that's the fundamental reason why so little is known about the singular sets once you step away from the Laplacian. So, so basically, what's the idea? You still have to deal with this instability, but you don't have formulas anymore. So how, how do you deal with this instability? So now let's go to the fully nonlinear version of the problem. And again, zero is a singular set. It's in a singular set. And again, our goal is to show that around the origin, we have this quantified version of the approximation result. Right? Our solution is approximated by a parabola solution in a quantified way. And as I was saying, I mean, it, it seems that our major enemy is this instability of the free boundary. Right? Sometimes you can remove the free boundary. Sometimes you can turn everything into regular points. We have to deal with this instability of the free boundary around the singular point. So actually, I mean, the, the, the main observation is actually very, very simple. So basically the question is, okay, the potential enemy is this instability of the free boundary. Right? Sometimes the free boundary disappears. Sometimes it turns into regular points. But, but the question, of course, is do we really have to worry about this instability? Right? Do we really have to worry about those situations? Actually, no, right? because basically, right, once you have this perfect dichotomy for free boundary points, right, there's, there's going to be regular points, there's going to be singular points. So basically, after this dichotomy, you always know whether you are looking at a singular point or a regular point. Right? So for instance, here, we always know a priori that the origin is in a singular set. You don't have to worry about the singular point disappears or it turns into regular points. We know for sure zero is in a singular set. Right? And, and once you have this piece of information, actually this instability is helping us because you can use this instability to show rigidity of the solution. Right? So, so basically this instability means a, around a singular point, the solution is very rigid. You cannot perturb the solution at all because most of those perturbations you can do around a singular point, they will not preserve the singular point anymore. But, but you always know the singular point is always there, which means you can not perturb the solution at all around a singular point. So the solution is very rigid around a singular point. And so, so in terms, I mean, in terms of solution itself, what this means is actually you should expect uh, you can improve the regularity of the solution around a singular point. So, so, so in general, what we know is, even for the case of the Laplacian, what we know is the solution in general is not C2, because the Laplacian can jump from one to zero across the free boundary. The, Laplace, the solution is in general is not C2. But what we're trying to do here, we're, we're trying to get this estimate at a singular point. So what we're showing here effectively is the solution is C2 at the origin. Because we're effectively showing our solution is approximated by a second order polynomial in a way that is better than a quadratic. So here we're actually showing at a singular point, the solution should enjoy uh, higher regularities than at the general free boundary point. So, so basically, this is, the, this is a strategy. So basically, we'll be, since we're dealing with the fully nonlinear problem, what we have is maximum principles. And what, what we'll be doing is we'll be using maximum principles and we'll be using this instability to help us to improve the regularity of the solution. And in this way, we can get an estimate, quantified estimate like this. Okay, so what can we actually prove? So basically, this is our result. Again, this is based on a recent joint work with Ovidio Savin at Columbia University. And this is the result. And I don't know the res result again, because basically this is the same result as for the Laplacian. So, so again, you have decomposition into D pieces. Each piece is of some dimension with some regularity. So as I was saying, I mean, this is the first result for nonlinear operators. 
And so, so even for the classical problem, even when you, if you just care about the Laplacian, we have a completely different proof. And so we believe this is even interesting for the, for the classical case. All right. So let me just quickly uh, explain some ideas in, in the proof. So again, uh, this is our goal, right? Our goal is to show that around the origin, we can find this one uh, parabola solution that approximates our solution in a quantified way. Right? So what is this saying is basically for all small scales, uh, for smaller and smaller scales, I can improve the approximation in a quantified way. So basically without monotonicity formula, it's very difficult to get all small scales at once. So what we plan to do is to basically do one scale at a time. So what do I mean by that? What do I mean is uh, I'll do a discretized version of this. So basically our starting point is, suppose we know somehow the solution is very well approximated by one parabola in the unit scale. Right? In B1, our solution is well approximated by one parabola. What we want to do is we want to do the following. We want to say, I can find uh, possibly a different parabola P prime so that when I go from B1 to a smaller ball, I can improve this approximation from epsilon, epsilon prime by using a different parabola. So this is the discretized version of the previous estimate. So what I'm trying to do is suppose I know in B1, the solution is well approximated. I want to show that if I go to the next scale, I can find a different parabola and I can improve this approximation. So, so if you can do this on time, what you can do next is you can rescale, apply this again, rescale, reply this again. So what you have is uh, you have a sequence of parabolas uh, each time when approximation by some amount. And so if you can really show each time you're improving a lot, you can show this sequence of parabolas will converge to a limit and the limit will give you this quantified version of approximation. So again, what I have to do is each time, if you have well approximated solution in unit ball, let's try to improve this when we go to the next ball. And if you want a quantified version means to get C1 alpha Calvary, we need to improve like this. We need to have a geometric decay in terms of the epsilon. So each time you have to decay by a fixed portion. To get C1 log covering, each time you have to decay by epsilon to a huge power. So here M is very, very large number. So if you want to get C1 log covering, each time you have to decay uh, by epsilon to a huge power. So compare with this, I mean, so this is a much, much slower decay than in the previous case. So in the end, this, will, this, this very slow decay will give us some, some, some problems, but let's not worry about that right now. So again, this is the, our goal. I'm going to say from B1 to the next ball, I can always improve the approximation. But, but actually, I mean, we cannot do this directly. So it turns out for some, for some technical reasons, we have to also carry, carry with us the, the convexity of the solution. And so what our assumption will be actually, suppose in B1, our solution is well approximated by parabola P. And also in B1, our solution is almost convex. So from here, what we can show, what we plan to do is we'll show that if I go to the next ball, then my convexity improves a bit. And also my approximation improves a bit. So basically our, we have one more assumption with us, almost convexity of the solution. And in the improvement, you have to improve both the approximation and also the convexity of the solution. So that, 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 that's, that's what we'll do, we'll, do, we'll do now. Okay, so let's do this in a very concrete setting. So now we are, we're back in 2D, we are back with Laplacian, and zero is assumed to be a singular point. And suppose we know, but our assumption is, our solution is well approximated in B1 by parabola. And now let's just deal with this one dimensional parabola. And our solution is almost convex. So our goal is to show in the next ball, we can improve both this approximation and this convexity. So what you do, I mean, for first, there are a lot of epsilon. So what we do is first we normalize. So this U hat is the normalized solution defined like this. And the O hat is the normalized parabola defined like this. And so basically there are only two steps in this argument. The first step is we show that for all these small epsilons, this family of normalized solutions 
it's a compact family. So in particular, when epsilon is going to zero, this normalized solution still converge to some limit. And secondly, we show the limit is C2 at the origin. So, so what do we know once we have these two steps? So basically, by definition of a normalized solution, we always know our solution is this one particular parabola plus epsilon times normalized solution. But this is how we define the normalizations. And now if you have step one, if you know epsilon, u hat epsilon is converging to u hat zero, what I know is I can replace u hat epsilon by u hat zero. What I get is a very small error in terms of epsilon. And now if you know further that u hat zero is C2 at the origin, what I can do is I can replace u hat zero by second order Taylor expansion Q. So by C2 regularity, what I know is if I stay in a small ball, this, re this replacement will give me another tiny error in terms of epsilon. Right, so what I know from here is, okay, the first two leading terms, these two terms, they give me a, a second order polynomial. Right? I mean, so you still have to do some modifications, but already if you take this as your next parabola, right, you are already improving a lot your epsilon. You can improve a lot the, the approximation if you just take this as your next uh, parabola. I mean, you have to do some modifications, but this is the main idea. Yes, basically two steps. The first step, this family is compact. The second step, the limit is C2 at the origin. All right. So what do we know about the, the, the family? So this is what we know about the family. So first of all, what we know is since our solution U is well approximated by P, I know this normalization is always less than or equal to one. And I also know U is always non-negative. So I know u hat is always above o hat. Okay, and I also know if u hat is really strictly above o hat, so that means u is strictly positive. So in this set, the plus of u is one. In this set, the plus of p is also one. So in this set, when they are not in contact, the plus of u hat is zero. So what do we have? We have two functions, u hat and o hat. Uh, uh, one is always above the other. And when they are not in contact, the function on top is harmonic. Right? So this is exactly the second formulation of the obstacle problem. So this says u hat solves the obstacle problem with o hat as the obstacle. So, so here again is a 1D picture. So what I know is the top function, which is u hat, is always between these two horizontal lines. And what, what I know is when epsilon is getting smaller and smaller, this O hat, they are getting more and more concave. They are getting more and more concentrated around the hyperplane. Okay. So as you can expect, you should expect the contact set will also be more and more concentrated around the hyperplane. So what you can show is the contact set between these two functions is always contained in the epsilon strip around the, the hyperplane. So why is this useful? But basically, I mean, again, our goal is to show this family is compact. And basically, the, our enemy is each time we're dividing by a tiny number. So, so these functions themselves, they are very rough functions. But what we know is, if you can show the contact set is always inside this tiny strip. And if you just do a direct computation, you can show, I mean, the, the, Lapla, the, the gradient of u hat is like one of epsilon times x1. So within this tiny strip, I mean, the epsilon and epsilon cancels. So this is uniformly bounded by universal constant. So this says, although you have, I mean, although each time you're dividing by tiny constant and this O hat is becoming very, very, very concave. But in the region where the functions contact, actually all this O hat, they are uniformly Lipschitz. And, and from here you can show that U hat is also uniformly Lipschitz. And this gives us enough compactness to show they'll converge to some limit. Right? And again, our next step is to show uh, this O hat is C2 at the origin. Right? So, so for this family, what, what I was saying is, I mean, this family of solutions that are solving the obstacle problem with the obstacle more and more concentrated around the, the hyperplane. Right? So you should expect in the limit, the, the limiting solution will actually solve the obstacle problem with the obstacle entirely contained in the hyperplane. So basically that, that's the following problem. So that's the thin obstacle problem. 
So, so I mean, actually, don't, don't worry about those equations. So what you're having is, physically speaking, again, just a membrane on top of an obstacle. But uh, the only difference is, instead of asking the function to be non-negative in the entire ball, we only ask the function to be non-negative along the hyperplane. So this saying basically that the obstacle is only inside the hyperplane. This is the thing obstacle problem. And again, our goal is to show the solution to this problem is C2 at the origin. Well, the, the, the bad news is, in, in general, the solution is not C2. So, so here are some examples. So the first picture, we're looking at the, the, three, the three half solution. So this solution is only C11 half. It is not C2. And the second example is even simpler. So what you're having in the second picture is just you're having two half planes meeting at an angle along the hyperplane. So this is also a solution to the thing obstacle problem. And this solution is not even C1, it's just Lipschitz. So again, both solutions here are not C2, which is bad news for us. But the, the, the good news is, using some theory about this thing obstacle problem, what you can show is, in some sense, uh, these two are the only bad examples. So if, if you can somehow rule out these two examples, the next example, the next solution is already C2. So, so basically to show uh, C2 regularity of this solution in our, uh, as our limit, we just have to somehow rule out uh, these two bad examples. Okay, so let's see how do we rule out these exa examples. Okay, so this is the first bad example, the three half solution. So basically the, the main observation of this solution is this solution is strictly increasing in x2 direction. But by some direct computation, you, you can show this. And what, you, what we know is we have this expansion of our original solution u. Right? So we know our solution is this parabola plus this piece plus a tiny error. And what we realize is for the first piece, the derivative in x2 direction is zero. For the second piece, the derivative in x2 direction is strictly positive. So from here, you can uh, show that the original solution to our problem will be increasing in all directions close to x2. So this is a typical uh, improvement of monotonicity argument. So we can show our original solution will be increasing in all directions close to e2. So what does this actually tell us? So it tells us this form. So, so imagine this is the x2 direction. This is the x1 direction. So what I've shown, what I've shown is our solution will be increasing in all directions in this green cone here. You have, you have a tiny cone of directions along which our solution will be increasing. And what I know is, I know my solution is zero as zero. And I know my solution is always non-negative. So this means if I start from the origin and I start going the negative cone of directions, my solution has to vanish in this entire cone right? because it has to decrease from zero, but it cannot be below zero. So my solution actually vanishes in the entire cone. And that's a contradiction because we know that the origin is assumed to be a singular point and around a singular point, the density of the contact set should be vanishing. And there's no way you can have a cone, entire cone of zeros along a singular point. Right? So, so we see actually here, we're actually using the instability of the singular point to help us to rule out this case. Okay, so this help us rule out the three-half solution. So how do we rule out the two-plane solution? So here you have two parameters, alpha and beta. So let's say if alpha is positive. Right? If alpha is positive, then again, we have this expansion for solution u. So this means our solution has a tiny linear part that is going up in x1 direction. So from here, you can build barriers and show that u0 has to be strictly positive. And that's a contradiction because we know u0 has to be zero because zero is in a singular set. So again, here we're using the instability of the free boundary. This is basically saying, I mean, singular set is so unstable. If I can just perturb slightly up in x1 direction, then I entirely removed the free boundary. So this is instability of the free boundary, but now it's helping us to rule out this case. So using, using this argument, we can show alpha cannot be positive. So with the same argument, you can show beta also has to be non-positive. Right? So now what happens if alpha is negative? Right? So if alpha is negative, then you have the same expansion, but instead of a line, instead of a linear part that's going up, you have a linear part that is going down. 
Uh, and with that, we can again build barriers to show u has to be zero along a tiny line segment like this. So, so what, what does this tell us? So I mean, remember, we have this convexity with us. So what, what we know is Hessian, I mean, u is almost convex. And we know u is very well approximated by a parabola that is fully convex in x1 direction. So basically combines almost convex everywhere and it's a full convexity of the parabola in x1 direction. What you can show is our solution will be convex in all directions close to E1. So this is a improvement of convexity. So using the convexity of the parabola, you can improve the convexity in all directions close to E1. So basically what we have now, right? What I have now is I know my solution is zero along a tiny line segment here by building the barrier. And I also know my solution is zero at the origin. So using this convexity in all directions close to U1, I can connect the origin to the line. And again, this gives me a cone of, direction, a cone of zeros for the solution. And again, this is impossible because zero is a singular point and around a singular point, the density of the contact set is zero. There's no way you can have a full cone. So, so again, what we use is again, the instability of the free boundary at a singular point. As it says, if I can push down a bit, a tiny bit in the x1 direction, then I don't have a singular point anymore. By pushing down, I have, I'll have a regular point at the origin. So basically with this, both coefficient has to be zero. So this helps us to rule out this bad example. And after this, uh, we know uh, u zero is C2 at the origin. <laughs> right, so basically this, this completes the program almost. So what we have now is right, we, we take the leading two terms, which gives a parabola solution and taking the parabola solution, if I stay in a very small ball, uh, we have a very good approximation. We can improve epsilon to delta epsilon for, for any small delta. Right, but the, the, the problem is we have to also have to improve this convexity because that's part of the assumption in our argument. So how do you do that? So what I know is, I mean, away from the hyperplane, right, because basically my solution is well approximated by one dimensional parabola. So what I can show is the zero set is always very close to this hyperplane. So basically away from this hyperplane, both my function u and the solution p prime, they are both, they both have Laplacian equals one. So the difference is harmonic away from the hyperplane. So by the, the previous estimate, what I can use is I can use a C2 regularity for harmonic functions. I can show the Hessians are very, very close to each other. Where C is a universal constant. If I take delta to be very small, this is a very, a uh, small distance between the two Hessians away from the free boundary, away from the hyperplane. So what I know is P prime is a parabola solution. So in particular, P prime is convex. So you can use this to show in this ball, and this is a ball away from the hyperplane. So in this ball, uh, you can show, I can improve the convexity of U from epsilon to delta times epsilon. So this is a lot of improvement away from the free boundary. So you also know in the entire ball, my function, my, my solution is almost convex. So using uh, electricity by building barriers, you can diffuse this huge improvement away from the boundary. And this uh, combine that with this almost convexity in the entire ball, you can improve convexity by a geometric amount. Cool. So basically this completes the, this program in this very simple setting. Right? We're basically in this sim simple setting, we're only dealing with one particular parabola, and this parabola is going up only in one direction. But, but, but as you can imagine, I mean, with the same similar argument, you can deal with this case. So in this case, uh, I mean, we are dealing with more general parabolas, but still we are saying basically the parabola only have only has one large eigenvalue. So the, the second eigenvalue of the parabola is comparable to epsilon. So it only has one large eigenvalue. The parabola still is going up only in one direction in some sense. So then you can more or less apply the same argument as before. You can show if I go to B, from B1 to the next ball, I can improve convexity geometrically and I can improve approximation geometrically. So this is very nice. This is very nice. Basically here, again, all, all the problems in this lemma, they're only going up in one direction. So we should expect our solution, our zero set, concentrate along a hyperplane. So here we're more or less dealing with the 
highest stratum where you should expect C1 alpha covering. And this geometric decay is consistent with that uh, C1 alpha covering. Okay, so, but now after this, you have to deal with all those other parabolas that has more than one large eigenvalue. So we have to be able to drop this condition. So here, I mean, the, the problem is much, much more delicate. So, so basically now you have to deal with parabolas that are, that are going up in more than one directions. So here you should expect the zero set to be concentrated around something of higher co-dimension. So, so basically, first of all, I mean, in higher co-dimension, barriers are not available anymore. It's, it's very difficult to construct barriers in higher co-dimension spaces. And secondly, even if you just think about the result, right? The, the final result, what we know is, if you're talking about higher co-dimension, which means you're talking about the intermediate stratums. So there, you're only expecting C1 log covering. So there, uh, you're only expecting the decay from epsilon to epsilon prime to be a very slow decay. And here again, M is a huge power. So this is very, very slow when epsilon is slow. Uh, when epsilon is small. So, and recall, I mean, this is just one step. We'll be, approved, we'll be using this over and over again. We'll have a sequence of parabolas, and our goal is to show the sequence will converge to something. So basically, if you look at the difference between the nth parabola in your sequence and the mth parabola in your sequence, you can control the difference basically by the sum of all the epsilons you, can, you, you take in the, in the estimate. So basically, if you have, if each time you are geometrically decaying, then what you have here is a geometric series, which, which is summable. So this summability of this series means, I mean, your P, the, the, the parabolas will converge to a limit. But if you only have this very slow decay, right, and there's no guarantee this will converge, and there's no guarantee your parabolas will converge to something, then this will be a big problem for us. Right? So basically, to deal with this, Two problems, I mean, in this case, when lambda two is large, you have to have a much more delicate estimate. So basically, this is it. So again, now we're dealing with uh, the parabola with more than one large eigenvalues. So even the second, large, second eigenvalue is very large. So still, we're trying to improve the convexity, but still trying to improve the, the, the epsilon, the, the approximation. But now we have to really pay attention to this improvement. There were again a dichotomy for the epsilon. So either in the first case, it's the good case. So in the first case, you're still decaying geometrically. So everything just works as in the previous case. But in case your epsilon prime is decaying very slowly like this, then what you have to do is you have to have a much better approximation. So what we can show is in this case, we can approximate U using the solution to the unconstrained problem. And so basically H is the, main, the shape of the membrane when you keep pushing and when there's no, no obstacle. And so just, this is a free membrane. So in this, small, in this second case, what you can show is the difference between you and this solution is like this. So when epsilon prime decays like epsilon to, minus epsilon to the n, and this difference here is effectively epsilon to the n, which is a very, very fast decay improvement in, in the approximation. So basically combining these two, we can deal with those two problems I, I was saying in, in the previous slides. Okay, so I guess, I mean, so again, this is our result. And so again, after this result, basically, again, you, ha you have, a, now we have a very nice conceptual picture in our mind about the, the zero sets in this fully nonlinear setting. And of course, we hope uh, this method can be applied to other nonlinear free boundary problems where, again, monotonicity formulas are not available. I think that's the end, and thanks for your attention. So now if you have any questions, let me know.